Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. It's Coolman Cutter Grinder time again. We've got some really cool parts to show you and we've got to make some more tools, so let's go. So I have two other projects that are currently stalled because my mill is down. It had a minor explosion. The electrical box uh, made a little supernova. I'll be doing a separate video on what happened there and all about that repair. But uh, this is good news for you machinery restoration fans because today we're going to work on the Coolman SU2 cutter grinder instead. So I'm going to continue with the teardown of this thing and it's easy to get intimidated by a project like this because there are a ton of parts, it's hard to know where to begin. What I like to do in a case like this is just take a step back and uh, make a plan of attack. So what I've decided to do is uh, start with the work head. It's a very complex sort of super assembly and uh, what I'm going to do is uh, focus on removing the work head and then breaking it down into its major constituent assemblies. It's clear at the outset that I can't remove the entire work head as one unit because uh, the bar that it slides on goes through that bottom casting and it's all one piece. However, I should be able to remove uh, the top sections of the work head. And it looks like maybe this uh, kind of double nutted weird fastener or spanner thing at the bottom uh, is what needs to maybe come off. So uh, I'm going to try removing this guy first. Now clearly there's some sort of special purpose spanner wrench type thing that you're supposed to use here, uh, which I obviously don't have. But uh, it is interestingly a perfect fit for the jaws on my uh, needle nose pliers. So I took a shot at loosening it uh, and of course that didn't work. Uh, I tried holding the rear nut with uh, the end of a punch. That also didn't work. Uh, then I tried kind of bracing the punch against the bottom uh, and that also didn't work. And uh, I'm starting to get mixed feelings about all this because as you can see, I'm not the first person to try and do this with the wrong tools. And I don't want to chowder this thing up any worse than it already is. However, I am a big fan of chowder, so we'll try a couple more wrong tools. Uh, oftentimes, uh, just a little bit of impact will work where brute force won't. It's why impact wrenches and impact drivers are so great. So uh, I thought I'd try a little tappy tap tap. And uh, this just caused the punch to skip out of place. So I tried securing the butt end of it with a screw. And that did succeed in knocking a bunch of grit out, but uh, the punch still wouldn't just stay in place. So uh, this is clearly not the right thing to do. So uh, I took a step back and realized that actually that's not the right part to remove first. There's a much easier way to remove the entire work head. In fact, there's a convenient handle that I can just simply unscrew and the entire work head comes off. So uh, I'll be able to attack those weird spanner nut things later with uh, better access. It just goes to show when you're stumped on something, just take a step back and go work on something else for a while and uh, you might have better luck. And here's a preview of the first of many really cool parts that are in this machine. There's kind of a cone shaped spring ring thing in here that's uh, applying tension to that swivel. And uh, eh, that's a really cool part that will give us a little bit of an adventure in uh, an upcoming video. But uh, now we can also get a look at uh, the base and it looks like it's in good condition and just wanted to confirm that there is in fact no way to remove that. A quick sidebar on this work head. If you're wondering why it looks like a 1960s spacesuit, it's because it's actually doing a very similar job. It's allowing you to position something in three dimensional space within a given work envelope while only using very simple joints. And uh, so that's why it, it looks kind of like a robot arm. It's a series of swivels in uh, different dimensions that allow you to very precisely position that part or that tool that you're grinding in 3D space relative to that grinding wheel. So the top of the work head is a dividing head, which allows you to move between two specific angles, in this case, 90 degrees. And then we can move this selector to lock it in place. And then there's also a third setting on this little selector that allows it to free spin for doing circular grinding. The next most logical thing to dismantle seems to be this uh, pair of dovetail slides here that are interface these two sections. And there's a, a lead screw here, this little thumb wheel, and it's uh, it's very stiff, so uh, I don't think it's, it's going to unthread all the way. So I thought I'd start by loosening the gib adjusters here, back those off a little bit, and uh, maybe that'll free things up. And uh, that uh, still didn't seem to help very much. Uh, so there is a lock here. This lock seems to be loose, but uh, maybe it's uh, snagging on something. So uh, I cleaned out the slot. You know, these uh, shallow slotted head screws are very easy to strip. And so uh, I always uh, clean them out thoroughly to make sure that the uh, screwdriver gets a, a firm seat down in that screw. 
And uh, so I thought I'd try unscrewing this guy, and uh, yeah, that handle would not budge. So uh, that, uh, that'll come back to haunt us later, actually, but uh, for now I'll just leave it since it does seem to be loose. Well, when in doubt, look for more fasteners. These scales were installed with big screws, which struck me as a little suspicious. You'd expect them to uh, to, to just be using drive pins for uh, a scale like this. So I thought I'd remove that and see if there was some fasteners underneath. And uh, so the screws came out fairly easily. And uh, there's a nice uh, alignment pin on this uh, scale, which is really nice. So the fasteners are just holding it to the part and the alignment pin makes sure that the scale is in the right position. And nope. No fasteners underneath, so this uh, comically overly fastened scale is uh, just German engineering. My next candidate for some assistance was uh, this plastic plug here. This is opposite the uh, thumb operated uh, lead screw that I demonstrated here on the slide. So I thought there might be something back in there, like a, you know, a, a, a screw holding the thumb wheel in place from the back, something like that. And I uh, shined shine a light down there and nope, nothing down there. So I think that's just a, just a dust plug. When all else fails, uh, just uh, remove whatever you can remove. So it's pretty clear that the thumb wheel here that operates the top half of the slide uh, is going to have to uh, come off uh, in order for the slides to separate. So there's an E-clip here that I can remove, so I'll remove it. And uh, let's see if it ends up in the far corner of the shop, as these things always do. And uh, actually this one cooperated quite nicely. And then there's a little bushing behind that. And things are still not moving, so I thought I'd uh, get some penetrating oil in there and uh, maybe see if uh, things uh, could be loosened up and maybe things are just stuck. And uh, so I let that soak for a while. And hey, I'm not proud of this next moment, but I did try tapping on it a little bit with a rubber mallet to see if I could uh, jar those slides loose. And uh, yeah, well, it's always darkest just before the dawn, and this is when I finally realized that actually what I need to do is just completely remove the gibbs on the dovetail slides. And there's probably no excuse for not having understood this right away, because I have actually taken my own lathe apart, uh, and I've watched Keith Rucker take apart dovetail mechanisms thousands of times, so I don't know why it didn't occur to me to take the gibbs out right away. But here we are. So, out come the gib adjusters completely. And a little light tap from one end. And I could tell that the gibbs are moving quite easily, so there's nothing snagging it up here. And out it comes. That gib looks like it's in good shape. You can see the indentations for the locking screw and the two adjusters. And uh, yeah, so now clearly that was the right thing to do because everything is quite loose. So it uh, seems to be just a matter now of jimmying things around until it'll slide out. There's uh, a few little uh, fiddly bits that want to keep it from uh, coming all the way out, but it's uh, clearly wants to. And there it goes. So now we can apply those lessons to the other slide and remove the gib adjusters. And these ones are a lot longer for some reason, so it uh, pays to keep all the parts in the right places because uh, things might look the same, but well, they might not be the same. And this one seemed a little stuck. It would move a little bit, but not all the way out. And that's when I realized that I still had this locking handle in place. Luckily, I uh, didn't damage the gib. I didn't try too hard before it was clear it didn't want to move. The uh, the previous gib actually had a locking screw in place as well, and I just got lucky that one happened to be loosened enough that it wasn't impeding it. And out comes the other gib. This is a good moment to stop and talk about gibs and dovetails and how they actually work together. Dovetails are very good at maintaining alignment of two surfaces in multiple dimensions, but uh, you still need to be able to slide those two surfaces in one desired dimension, and it's very difficult to create a surface that can both slide and maintain precise alignment. And uh, so if, as the old saying goes, if you can't make it perfect, make it adjustable. So the gib, what that guy does is it takes up space between two of the dovetail surfaces and it allows you to adjust the tension between those two surfaces. And so you can uh, very precisely dial in the exact amount of friction between the surfaces and how much space is being taken up by the gib and thus find a sweet spot between precision alignment and still being able to move. Uh, a good way to think about it is that uh, the jib's most crucial function is as an airfoil. It increases performance and overall stability by reducing turbulence on the mainsail's leeward side. And... Wait a minute. This is the entry for jib. Jib, get me the gib one. Excuse me, I need to go fire our research department.
Now, extraction of the lead screw in that upper slide still remained a mystery, but I suspected, much like on a lathe, once the lower slide was removed, it would expose some sort of fastener that allows access to the upper slide, and that did appear to be the case. So I could see through the hole here there was a slot uh, for what looked like a screw, and so I tried to uh, put a small screwdriver in there, and I turned a little bit, and it seemed like maybe it was going to work, and so I put a little more uh, muscle on it, and... Yeah, this didn't feel good. Something wasn't right here. It, uh, it didn't seem like it was actually going to loosen up. So I took a step back and I realized, oh, actually there's a bigger hole to the right. So by turning the lead screw, I could see that whatever this thing with the slot in it was sliding over. So I slid it over until it lined up with the big hole. And now I could see that, yeah, sure enough, this was a lead screw nut. So then I put uh, a big screwdriver on there and figured it would turn and pr probably unthread once it was clear of the lead screw. And it did turn, but it never seemed to quite loosen. And that's when I noticed that uh, it was sticking through on the top as well. You can see it exposed here, so uh, I could feel it turning but not loosening. So that pretty much means that it must not be threaded. And so I took a little bit of a leap of faith and I gave it a light tap from above. And sure enough, it was just kind of a press fit in that, uh, in that casting. And so that guy uh, popped out and uh, it looks like it's still in pretty decent shape despite my abusing it with uh, various incorrect tools trying to remove it. Okay, that pair of dovetail slides is finally free, so now we can start looking at the next section up, and uh, I can remove this uh, locking handle here, but that, uh, yeah, that locking handle doesn't seem to want to come out all the way, so there's something fishy there, and there's still something holding this uh, assembly together, so I thought it might be this big screw down here, so I'll clean this guy out and give it a shot with a screwdriver, and it certainly comes out easily enough. It's still no dice. I think that big screw was just some kind of a lock. So uh, yeah, I avoided the inevitable, but uh, it's clear that my old nemesis, the double spanner nut thing, is uh, what needs to come apart next. For jobs like this, I keep a box of cheap Chinese sockets around that I don't mind mangling. So I found a good diameter and uh, blued it up with some Sharpie. And then I just lined it up on the spanner there and I marked where each of the notches were. And then I measured the depth with the caliper to figure out how deep these tabs are going to need to be that I'm going to make. And I marked that on the socket. And so here you can see the profile that I'm going to cut out. Now sockets, even cheap Chinese ones, are hardened tool steel, so I'm not going to be able to cut these. So it's off to the grinder. So a little bit of delicate work with the grinding disc on the angle grinder to remove the bulk of that material. And then I came back in with a uh, cutting disc just to square up the uh, profiles of each of the little teeth. And after a bit more massaging, here's the final result. So you'll, you'll notice it only has three teeth. I got one of the teeth in the wrong place. I misinterpreted my scribe marks. What I thought was the inboard line was an outboard line. So one of the teeth ended up offset. So I just ground it off. I only need three. And uh, that's a good fit on there. So. I thought I'd try my needle nose pliers trick again on the other uh, nuts so that I can pull against it with the, my new socket. But of course, you know how that's going to end. That didn't work at all. And so now we have a little more chowder. And uh, I was just about to go ahead and make a spanner wrench for that lower nut out of some bar stock when I thought, well, just before I do that, I'll try the last refuge of the scoundrel, the vice grips. And honestly, it didn't take a very tight grip at all with those vice grips. It didn't even mark up the nut, and uh, that guy came apart like a boss. That was a good moment, I won't lie. That thing fought me for quite a while. So with big mystery spanner nut things removed, the whole assembly slides apart like a charm. Very nice. You can see there's a little bit of rust in there, but things generally look pretty good. And I'll go ahead and put those nuts back on there. As I go along, I'm reinstalling all the fasteners where they belong, because when I'm done taking this whole thing apart, I'm going to have a million bajillion pieces, and uh, I'll never remember where they all go. And with that, we've got the work head broken down into its major assemblies. We've got the dividing head, and the cross slides, and the middle bit, and the middle bottom bit, and yeah. Uh, so it's looking good. So the next step I think is going to be to break down each of these assemblies and uh, restore them and bring them back up again. 
But that is going to do it for this time. I hope you've enjoyed watching this process. Stay tuned next time for more sweet, sweet D-Bit Grinder restoration action. Thanks for watching.